Paris, uh, Khalifa University. And he will give a presentation entitled Hydrogen as a Fuel for Industrial Decarbonization. And um, in the interest of time, without further ado, um, Steve, please go ahead. Uh, you shared your slide, so you take the lead. Okay, thanks very much, Martin. It's a pleasure to be here today. I appreciate Kaos giving me the invitation to talk at the event. So far, very interesting material, and so hopefully we'll continue with that with my presentation. What I'll be talking about today is hydrogen and fuel for industrial decarbonization. And just a bit of context, the work I'll be presenting is one part of one study that I'm doing with a team, international team, including Benjamin Silverpool at the University of Sussex and Morgan Bazilian at Colorado School of Mines and Jin Soo Kim at Hanyang University. We're looking broadly at industrial decarbonization. We have 12 systematic reviews happening right now that will be published in the course of 2021. And so this is just one particular part of a work that I'm doing on hydrogen as a fuel for industrial decarbonization. Given the context of the conference today, I figured the focus would be blue hydrogen. Seems very fitting given the crowd that we're, uh, we're having with us today. And so that's where I'll put my effort. With the blue hydrogen, just to orient toward where the presentation's headed, the question always comes up is one, why hydrogen? You know, what, why are we going to hydrogen? Some people are actually thinking hydrogen is not the fuel of the future. And then secondly, if we go to hydrogen, why are we going to blue hydrogen? Why would we not be all green? You know, that's certainly that's a European perspective is that green is good, blue maybe less so in the long run. So we'll try and figure out what exactly we should be doing with blue given its, its unique characteristics and opportunities for utilizing it economically. So with that said, I'll get straight into the presentation. First, just to set the context, why are we caring about hydrogen? We start back at the whole idea of energy transition. And so we all know at some point in time, we were a renewable based society. It was, we went forward in time and, and demand for energy increased. We got more and more reliant on hydrocarbons. Now the question come up, as you see from Equinor, are we coming to the end of what has been characterized as the oil age? And by 2100, will we be back toward renewables this time to modern renewables? And so it's a, you know, it's a good question. And so what, what is the opportunity we have now to look to the future and figure out what the energy system will be in, in the long run. With that additional uh, thought, just recently we've had the COVID pandemic. And so from the pandemic, we had this interesting once in a lifetime opportunity to see just how much of a challenge there is to achieve what we call the energy transition. Because eventually when the world came to a stop, we only reduced the greenhouse gas emissions to the extent during that period that we would need to reproduce over many, many years consecutively. And obviously shutting down the world for many, many years consecutively is not an option. And so as the economist said, is this the realization now of the magnitude of what we need to do? And does that give us the opportunity to catalyze progress? I think to some extent, the stimulus that we're seeing for recovery from COVID-19 opens up that opportunity. And certainly hydrogen strategies are now evolving very quickly in those recovery packages. So I think this is a very timely event to talk about the opportunities for this particular uh, energy vector. So when we talk about transitions, I'm gonna repeatedly refer to different studies that come from the gray literature as well as the peer reviewed. IEA studies, of course, come up prominently. Many of you are familiar, there is a sustainable development scenario, which plays off what we call the baseline or state of policy scenario. And so when I say sustainable development, or I say net zero, in the end, sustainable development is net zero. It's net zero by 2070. When people talk today about net zero and they start saying, you know, we're gonna be net zero in a certain country by uh, a date, which they don't always specify, what they mean is essentially 2050. So it's the catalyzation of efforts to achieve carbon neutral economies much quicker than what we had said previously was required for sustainable development. In both scenarios, they play off the Paris Agreement targets, one being the very aggressive limiting greenhouse gas or limiting car the, the global warming to one degree, 1.5 degree or less relative to pre-industrial levels uh, by the end of this, uh, this century. And then the other being the somewhat less intensive uh, effort, but still quite ambitious, the two degree scenario. And so half a degree actually makes quite a bit of difference when you look at the number of measures we're gonna have to take in order to achieve what has now been discussed as net zero. So I think now it's more of a net zero discussion that is making hydrogen in particular more and more interesting to talk about because we're gonna to have to start to consider more rapid transitions in the energy system. 
given that we talk about the transition, I think the playbook is not really changed. So I'm not suggesting that hydrogen is, a, is, is bringing us a difference of opinion from where we know we have to go with energy efficiency being probably first and foremost on our considerations, becoming less energy intensive, having better energy productivity. And then of course, trying to electrify as many of the end use sectors as possible and then supply them with power from clean renewables. So particularly solar and wind growing very quickly and now we have storage to complement. Where the hydrogen comes in particularly in, a, in, a, in an interesting way is these what we call hard to decarbonize sectors. So heavy duty transport, industrial sectors, which I've been focusing on in my work. And so in, we talk about industry, some people have different characterization of, of what exactly that means or the terminology differs amongst various people. We talk about chemicals, we talk about oil refining, we look at the iron and, and steel sector, we include ceramics, we include glass, we include you know, many other areas. I'd say for hydrogen though, we're particularly gonna focus on what we call the heavy industry. So it's an interesting opportunity. In addition, transportation, long haul transportation, heavy duty transportation, that's also an opportunity, although less so uh, part of what we're doing. So we're more oriented toward industry. So as we start to take this notion of hydrogen potentially being very good for industrial utilization, we look at what the sustainable development scenario tells us about where hydrogen might have a role. And so those that follow hydrogen at all, you know that pure hydrogen today is produced globally at about 75 million tons. In the future, if we're going to get to not even the net zero scenario with 2050 being net zero, but to 2070, the hydrogen in the economy to attack the, the challenge in decarbonizing the heavy duty long haul transport and industry, it would grow according to the scenario, the IEA scenario about sevenfold. And why is that the case? And as you can see on the right hand side of, the, of this diagram, all of the sectors that I've been mentioning around long haul transport, heavy duty transport, and they include refining of course in there, is a major projected consumer of hydrogen, not always in the pure form. So in many cases, we're talking about ammonia, we'll be talking about synthetic fuels. So syn fuels is an interesting topic, certainly for those interested in carbon dioxide. And when you can combine that with hydrogen, you get some interesting opportunities for fuels, which are compatible with current infrastructure and transportation. And then there's some direct use. On the industrial side, when you're looking at production of hydrogen purely for industrial purposes, here, primarily chemicals, iron and steel, you have a lesser demand, although a very important demand, because in my view, you're gonna look at some of these sectors, especially particularly chemicals, we talk about ammonia, methanol, and then refining. Hydrogen decarbonization is just, is just it's part of the process of going to sustainability because hydrogen is a direct input or direct feedstock to processes. So I'd say, although they're not the most important in this scenario, as far as ultimate utilization of hydrogen, they probably are the most realistic is where we can go to quickly with using utilization of hydrogen. Now, with that as background, what I'm gonna focus on more so is blue hydrogen. I'm gonna quickly come to what that means. Just give you a sense here when I say industry, I'm looking at refining and these more heavy industry sectors and then fossil fuel with carbon capture utilization storage is blue, which comes to next. And of course that complements what you've seen on the right, the left-hand side of the, the diagram here, which is this general projection, the green blue, which we're gonna talk about is gonna be a, a mix in the future, which is about 50-50, or we can debate that. Now, let's quickly go to the colors of hydrogen because they're out there in spades. As we went through our systematic review, it actually, it's, it's not so simple even to talk about the colors because you have the fossil-based uh, fuels, fossil-based hydrogen, which is one way to put a categorization behind the different colors. Then you have renewable hydrogen. Is it renewable or not? And what does renewable mean? And low carbon, and what does low carbon mean? And there are many standards and definitions now being put in place to bring definition. What we've done here is try to get a sense of what the colors mean from what we currently know and the status of the technologies to produce these colors of hydrogen. So black, brown are your different shades for coal. You know, lignite is of course one form of coal. Uh, it's a little bit more so used for power generation than black coal, but nonetheless it's a variant. Gray hydrogen is much, uh, much more of what we're talking about today when I talk about fossil-based uh, hydrogen. So gray hydrogen, it's fossil, hydrogen from thermal chemical process. Traditionally, we're talking about natural gas. Natural gas with steam methane reforming or autothermal reforming. I'll say a bit, about, a bit more about that in a minute. And the technologies are generally mature for the production of, production of gray hydrogen. It's used extensively in industry right now, so we know how to do this quite well. Blue hydrogen is simply, if you look at it without being overly general, which I've tried to be here a bit general by saying fossil plus carbon capture, 
it's really great hydrogen plus carbon capture. And so again, it's not as widely used today. That's what we're talking about in the session. We call it early adoption, although pressure swing absorption, which is typically used to capture the CO2 produced from the water gas ship reaction following a reformer, is a fairly well-established technology. So early adoption, but we're not su suggesting that the technologies are early stage. They're quite well-developed, to be quite honest. Turquoise hydrogen is a, is a little less so. Uh, I find this is very interesting. I'll mention it a few times in the presentation. This is where you don't worry about CO2 production. You're simply taking the hydrogen molecule and you're splitting it. You get carbon, you get hydrogen. And so you don't worry about CO2 production in the end. Although the technologies are not quite price competitive yet, there are some interesting investments being made now and companies have produced turquoise hydrogen. So I think that's something for us to watch. Is this crowd looking at the use of fossil energy for hydrogen production. Green hydrogen, although we all think wind and solar produce green, it's not quite that simple. There's a lot of definitions going on right now, a lot of standards being developed is what green means. Uh, it certainly would be low carbon uh, to many extents, but whether or not you would include biomass-based hydrogen in there, although it could be considered green, it's not often characterized as green. What is the carbon intensity of the hydrogen if it's going to be green? These are all issues we're debating now, and this will be part of the study we turn out. But I, I'll say for today, it is largely classified with low carbon and renewable hydrogen. And the technologies are early adoption. We see that happening with electrolyzers and such. We're splitting the water molecule, with things like solar energy. Yellow, pink, and purple, I'd say the least standardized from what I've seen is gonna be from nuclear. I see all shades are all colors coming out talking about nuclear, uh, more so probably yellow, but pink and purple also get used, just make you aware of it. We're not talking about it today so much, but it's also in the, in the overall framework of hydrogen production. And for those interested, of course, you can read all the footnotes and caveats. I try to protect what I say because it's not as simple as one might think uh, when you talk about the colors. But I'm really gonna focus on gray, blue, and a little bit about turquoise. We're not gonna get into the rest given time. So again, even when you talk about just a couple colors, it's not quite as simple as, as often is portrayed. With the blue hydrogen, they're you know, the dominant way to produce the hydrogen steam methane reformers. I'll say just right off the bat, the reason SMRs are used for uh, gray hydrogen and blue hydrogen production, blue hydrogen with capture, is that that typically will produce the most hydrogen for you. It's particularly in, in the water gas shift reaction, which follows the generation of your syngas, you get additional hydrogen from the water molecule itself. And so you get a nice mix of CO2 and hydrogen, and then you capture the hydrogen and the, and the CO2. And the CO2, of course, goes off and you do something either economically valuable with it or you store it. The other mechanisms, partial oxidation, a little less so used in industry, although autothermal forming, I'll bring up again later, it's a technology which is interesting because the addition of oxygen allows you to reduce the heating requirement or essentially eliminate the heating requirement in the reformer, which means you don't have to combust a fossil fuel for the heating of the reformer. And so you get a little bit less challenge in dealing with the CO2 from the overall process. You certainly, if you do the water gas shift, you have to deal with CO2 coming out of the gas shift reaction, but you're not combusting uh, a fuel to heat up a reformer. And so that more dilute stream often, which is gonna come off as a traditional fossil fuel, natural gas combustion, you don't have to deal with as much. So autothermal reforming, it's got a different mix uh, when it comes to this carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, H2 balance, even methane. If you want it for industrial purposes, more carbon dioxide, you might go to auto autothermal reforming. If you want a little less challenge in dealing with CO2, you might also go to autothermal reforming. And so I, I'm not going to go further on these technologies. What I'll say is you will see more uh, industry moving toward autothermal as opposed to steam methane, simply because if we're trying to go to net zero, having the lowest possible output of CO2 from a process is beneficial. And so that'll be just one of the examples I give later. And I'm going to mention turquoise because I like it. I think it's interesting. There are countries which can't really think about or they're not thinking about as much the, the opportunity for storage and so they don't want co2 they want perhaps just pure carbon and they want to find a way to utilize that in an economic way i do a lot of work with russia if you look what gazprom has been talking about they're deeply into the thinking of turquoise interestingly um less so are they thinking about storage although you know things change strategies are early but certainly turquoise is on the minds of many organizations so that gives you a pretty good idea of what's happening in the context of blue and variants of blue. As far as the, the economics of the gray and blue and then the sustainability of it, in this slide, 
you know, as you would imagine, there's no one number for how much it costs to produce either gray or blue hydrogen. It's going to vary based on the cost of natural gas extraction. And of course, to some extent, the OPEX and CAPEX costs and where you're located. But the natural gas price is, is traditionally driving this. Today, regardless of where you are globally, uh, gray hydrogen and blue hydrogen are cheaper than green, although projections for the future is that green is going to become more cost competitive than blue gray. So we'll see how that plays out with the cost of electrolyzers coming down, solar energy very cheap. But again, not my focus today. I'll just say that as of today, we know that we can produce fairly inexpensive, even blue hydrogen. So we're on the path to low carbon with, with, with not too great a cost. As far as sustainability, as I mentioned, in our reviews, there's a lot of work going on about what low carbon means. So obviously the, the blue is not renewable, but low carbon it is. And so with different levels of capture, you can get into the ranges in which the European Union and EU countries are putting together standards to certify the red two. Around four kg of CO2 per kg of H2 gives you a low carbon uh, hydrogen production process. I'll note that when we talk about differing capture rates, this is where the ATR and the SMR start to have an impact. If you don't capture the CO2 from a steam methane reformer in the heating part of the reformation process, you're gonna have a problem being low carbon. So you do have to make sure you're capturing the carbon from all parts of the process, from the water gas ship, and also from the heating of the reformer. And so, you know, this starts to, you start to think it's not just the economics of the process, it's now about uh, lining up with standards for sustainability, but you can do it. It's certainly there. So cost and compatibility with low carbon net zero pathways, I, I see it happening. What all of I, what, I, what I've said uh, in a practical sense, what it means for things we have to consider is yes, there is not one cost for any color of hydrogen. Actually, the cost is, is nuanced as well as the sustainability. When we think about blue hydrogen, the fact the factors to consider there's natural gas price makes sense. Cost the reformer, I mentioned the CapEx. Importantly, and where I'm going with the whole presentation is we start thinking about the whole CO2 piece, which I think is relevant for this group. Uh, the cost of, of implementing the required CO2 recovery is something that really has to be deeply considered in the scale of it, which we're gonna talk about shortly. And as well, the transport and storage opportunities for hydrogen and CO2. Again, these are gases which are not typically dealt with a very small scale. So it's, it becomes a more interesting challenge at the systems level to how to do this properly. On the blue hydrogen for the scale consideration, most of what we see is that when there is a discussion of blue hydrogen, you need scale. For low cost blue hydrogen, CCUS, there is a scale advantage. You need to have the ability to capture relatively large amounts of carbon uh, CO2 so that you can transport it and store it in an economical way, which means you also are producing a large amount of hydrogen and you need industry to be able to use that hydrogen. So you start thinking more and more that this blue hydrogen is not a consideration for everywhere. It might be more of a consideration for certain places. And I'll get into this idea of cluster shortly. Uh, and so that was pretty much what I was talking about here with the practical implications. We need to have the hydrogen demand at scale. We need to make sure there's infrastructure for hydrogen and CO2 supply and demand connectivity uh, so that we're able to produce a cost-effective uh, blue hydrogen. So when you look at one number and it looks inexpensive, there's a lot more to it than just that. Now, getting a little more deeply into this notion of the CO2, doing it at scale and doing it at low cost, what are we going to be able to do with the CO2? And again, the G20 uh, was mentioned earlier in the, in, the, in the discussions today. It was chaired Saudi Arabia last year and the circular carbon economy was central to that discussion. Circular carbon economy, I think is perfect alignment with blue hydrogen because we'd have hydrogen, we'll have the CO2. And if we can do something with the CO2, then you've got an argument that maybe blue is pretty good if you're going to go more towards circularity in your in your in your economy, at least with regard to the carbon. So a few ideas following off of what G20 talked about: we can reuse the CO2, we can remove it. This is the geologic storage was being discussed earlier, or we may reuse and remove. So an industry cluster, you may have some utilization of the CO2, and you may have some ability to optimally store the uh, the CO2. And so these are a couple of examples I'll talk about before I close out the presentation. Stephen, yeah, one minute or two at most, please. Sure, so just real quickly, so geologic storage, there's a great opportunity for that. Those who have not seen this nature sustainability paper, uh, it's certainly one that would be worth exploring. You look at countries around the world, there's great sinks for uh, enhanced oil recovery and aquifer storage. 
of course, you have to always consider how much storage you get from EOR. I'd say that though is, is an opportunity in, in, in certain countries more so than others. You go to aquifers, some countries where there's significant oil and gas production, we go with the, the uh, enhanced oil recovery. On the practical side of clusters, if you look at some of the places in the US where you have refining activity, the capabilities are there to produce CO2 and then transport it and then utilize it directly in industry. So that's a great example of where clusters can form. In the UK and, and elsewhere in Europe, for that matter, broadly in Europe, clusters are forming simply because you've got industrial uh, infrastructure, which allows you to think about utilization of CO2 at large scale, as well as storing offshore, for instance. And so I, I talk about the, um, sorry about that. I think the slides were, I apologize. The slides were not advancing. <laughs> the uh, high net project in, uh, in the UK is one that is worth talking about with regard to um, the opportunity for clustering. And so I'll just mention very briefly, in that particular project, the idea there is to use the autothermal former, as I mentioned, that's a particularly uh, good technology if you're trying to have a low carbon process. And then you've got this infrastructure that's planned to be built out. And so it, again, it's being done at scale. It's not a small scale idea. It's something that I think is very relevant for our consideration is that with hydrogen production, because of the CO2 and the blue hydrogen production, you need to think about scale. So connecting again, industry with the opportunity for hydrogen use and opportunities to utilize CO2 or store it robustly. And so that's why these clusters are forming uh, in various locations around the world. So as we close out, I'll just say, you know, there is a great opportunity to utilize a tremendous resource in natural gas. There's a huge trade in gas. We've got a tremendous resource that needs to be tapped into for the long run. But there are all these challenges I talked about, uh, particularly the, the need to have opportunities for CO2 utilization, the ability to have, of course, if you're going to scale, utilizing CO2, utilizing the hydrogen in clusters, and having the infrastructure for that, and then thinking about more broadly, the entire crater of a grave sustainability. So as you think about the natural gas connectivity of the whole process, besides the CO2 and the H2, ways in which you can produce uh, sustainably the, the methane, which of course is gonna to contribute to the sustainability of the entire process. So with that, I conclude the opportunity is there, I think for uh, blue hydrogen in industrial decarbonization. Hydrogen is a vector, not a not energy resource itself is a great potential uh, uh, source of decarbonization of the heavy industry and even long haul transportation and heavy duty transport as I talked about. For blue hydrogen, we talked about the need to look at the scale. And so with economies of scale, I'd say if we can find ways to build the cluster concept, which I've maybe talked about shortly, we'll be in a very successful place. And then finally, I'd say blue is not the end of the story. Eventually turquoise will be something for us to look at. And that would start to take us away from the whole conversation about the capture of CO2 and just utilizing carbon in its own right. So with that, I'll finish and I'll look forward to the question and answer session. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, that was a very broad and, and deep um, presentation. We move on in the interest of time to our um, next speaker and the final speaker for the